What do you think the spiritual impact of the Pope's visit will be on your archdiocese? I had the privilege of serving uh, the Archdiocese of Denver two years after Pope John Paul II visited there for World Youth Day. And uh, it was very clear from what everybody told me and what I saw with my own eyes that his visit transformed not only the, the diocese, but the city of Denver. It made it an entirely different kind of place. It got the attention of the world. Uh, Catholics who uh, came for the world meeting of families decided to come back and stay. Uh, a lot of the new energy present in the church we call the movements decided that they wanted to do foundations in uh, Denver. Now, having seen that, I, I know personally that the visit of the Pope can be hugely transformative, and I'm praying for that for our archdiocese, that we will become as energized for the church as the Pope has made the universal church energized by his new presence, his new style of being a Pope. Uh, so I have a lot of hopes that we're going to be different, more confident, more enthusiastic because of his visit. And more spiritual? Well, it, that's at the heart of what the church is. You know, the, the church is transforming people. And when we say spiritual, it means that it's a transformation of our spirits that leads to action. It's not enough for us to have a relationship with God. We have to decide because of that we're going to have a different kind of relationship with people. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a theme of this pope that we have to help the poor. And if we don't, we're not authentically spiritual. So spirituality shows itself in action. Otherwise, it just talk. You know, we have to prove by our actions that we mean what we say. How will that translate uh, in the individual parish, in a neighborhood parish? I think it'll translate in, in the neighborhood parish by people re renewing their commitment to be with one another every week for Sunday worship, mm -hmm. which is a, a place of being energized for the community work of the church. Uh, you know, going to church on Sunday isn't just about God and me, it's about God and us. And if we do it well, we get the support of our brothers and sisters, we give them a good example, we do things together, we can do things together in a much more energetic way than doing them alone. I hope it means that the parishes see themselves as part of a bigger group, which we call the Archdiocese, where you know it's not just our you know, 500 families or 800 families here, that's a church, but it's a million and a half people who belong to the Catholic Church in southeastern Pennsylvania. And that we'll care about them, that we'll care about the poor parishes, that we'll be uh, enthused when a parish does good things for the community and, and try to imitate what they do in our own parish, those kind of things, to recommit ourselves to our schools, both the schools that help the poor, and the schools that, you know, the Catholic population is very small, but nonetheless are doing good work with the poor, or our parish schools where uh, we actually learn on more than just a Sunday visit how to be a Christian in the world. That's what Catholic schools are all about. You have made substantial progress in reducing uh, a multi-million dollar budget deficit in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. I wonder if his visit, if the Pope's visit, will have a financial impact on the Archdiocese, a positive financial impact. Uh, you know, many of the financial problems we had are simply the result of keeping open buildings that were basically empty, where you know we kept doing things the old way when it wasn't effective. You know, parishes that had no people in them, schools that had very small number of students and still had uh, huge budgets. So we've tried to merge, actually, is what we've done. And if the, if the Pope's visit encourages people to recommit themselves to being an active part of their parishes, it's going to change our parishes. Perhaps we'll reopen some of them that have been merged because there'll be a reason to do it. And we have to do things that work and not just what we've done in the past. People are attached to the past because good things happen then, but we have to make sure those good things are still happening today. So the bottom line is the more people who are engaged with the church, by definition, the better your financial situation. It's only that. People put their money where their heart is, and if their heart isn't someplace, they don't contribute. Either time, talent, or treasure. Now, when I think of two million people coming out to the Ben Franklin Parkway to attend a mass celebrated by the Pope, my primary worry would be security. And I wonder, uh, on a scale of one to 10, how nervous are you about security? Well, I think that is the big, the big worry. And by security, we don't mean uh, you know, a, a terrorist attack. We mean just care for the people who are here, that they are comfortable enough not to be at risk in terms of their health or a hostility towards their neighbor, you know, to provide an environment that is manageable. 
And we do worry about that. You know, the parkway cannot hold two million people. There isn't, there isn't physical space for that. But the circle that we're drawing is much more than just the, you know, the center road down the parkway. It's surrounding neighborhoods, and we intend to have those places wired with t TV, you know, these jumbotrons, so that people can feel a real part of the event, even though they're not right next to the papal altar. You say you're not worried about a terrorist attack, and, and uh, that's certainly not just a terrorist. good to hear, but clearly where the Pope is, there is tremendous security, and particularly in an environment uh, where there are millions of people. I imagine that there are at least a dozen agencies that will be concerned about the worst possible scenario. Certainly, and it, it isn't just the papal security we need to worry about, but the people. I think Boston taught us that, you know, that there can be deliberate terrorist attacks against crowds. And so the, you know, I'm worried about that. Uh, certainly the people who are responsible for those things in our city and in our country are worried about that. But, you know, the, the Pope is going to receive personal protection, of course, from the, um, the federal government because he's a head of state. Uh, so we are really confident that we're going to do a good job. Um, but uh, I think everybody else who comes has to be c careful uh, about their neighbor and, and have concern about their neighbor so that we can have a very positive, pleasant experience uh, around uh, the whole visit. The perception of Pope Francis is that he is something of a reformer. Let's talk for a minute about uh, Catholics who get divorced and remarry. It seems the Pope is saying, let's bring the church to them and worry about the rules or worry about making them worthy later on. You don't agree with that approach, do you? Well, uh, first of all, I, I think it's important to understand that the Pope, like the rest of us who are bishops, believe what Jesus taught about marriage. And when people talk about the rules, what they're really talking about the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus didn't require, uh, nor would the Pope, nor do I, that people are following all the teachings of Jesus before they're loved and cared for. But if the implication is that we don't have to worry about the teachings of Jesus or we can be quiet about them, the Pope doesn't believe that, nor do I. Uh, so I think you do two things at one time. You love people, you know, that tell, tell them they're welcome and you mean it, but also you at the same time say, you know, this is what Jesus calls all of us to, not just you, but calls all of us to. And it's really important that we embrace the teachings of Jesus, that we trust him and believe him. We believe what he says because we believe in him. And the church has a duty to, to announce that joyfully with a, in a loving way all the time. Well, let's be specific. Uh, Catholics who get divorced and who remarry are not able to receive communion. Uh, in some circumstances, if they haven't gone through the process to analyze their marriage to see if it was a real marriage or not. But some of them do go through that process and they, they receive an annulment because there never was a, what we consider a genuine marriage in the first place. So it isn't like everyone who is divorced and remarriage isn't allowed to receive communion. But if people are indifferent towards that teaching of Jesus, then they should not receive communion. You know. But doesn't it seem like Pope Francis is trying to at least begin a conversation where the church is trying to extend itself to divorced and remarried Catholics, um, and if not, make specific reforms to engage them in the church and then to try to figure out at some future time how they can reconcile the situation. I don't think that the last thing that you said is actually correct because we don't wait to teach what Jesus teaches until a later time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's people misunderstand what the church is teaching on this is. Uh, many people think that if they're simply divorced, even though they're not remarried, they're not allowed to go to church or they can't receive communion. So I think the Pope is actually calling us to make sure that those who feel alienated from the church because of their marriage situation, they, they really do um, have an opportunity to engage the church and its pastors in a positive way so that we can help them receive communion, help them be fully incorporated in the life of the church. But we don't trick them into the church and then spring the teaching of Jesus on them. It's not an appropriate way to do anything. Jesus never did that himself. He was always very clear from the very beginning about the cost of being his disciple. You know, he said, if you're going to follow me, you have to take up your cross and follow me. He didn't say, follow me and I'll talk to you about those difficult things later. And we need to imitate Jesus in his totality and not just part of what he says. You said once, um, you don't receive communion unless you are in communion with the teachings of Christ. Gay marriage is not a possibility 
in God's plan. Tell me about that. Well, we think marriage is a, a permanent commitment of a man and a woman to each other for the sake of children. And all parts of that def definition or description of marriage is what we mean by marriage. Uh, two people of the same sex cannot have children together. And because of that, it can't be a marriage because marriage is about permanent love, commitment for the sake of children. And that's uh, the basis of, uh, we think, stable family life. And uh, we're never uh, talking about this in order to criticize other people. We're promoting this understanding of marriage that provides an environment of safety and security for the for children. And that's what the church has always meant by marriage and always will mean by marriage. It can't mean something else. Now you know better than anyone that the Pope created quite a buzz when in making reference to a gay priest he said, who am I to judge? And a lot of people interpreted that to mean that he was anxious to begin a conversation that might someday lead to a loosening up of church doctrine when it comes to homosexuality. Well, the, the, those folks who do that haven't read what the Pope says about um, gay marriage because he doesn't see it as a possibility. He said that very clearly, that he's the son of the church. Uh, when he said, who am I to judge, he was simply quoting uh, the practices of the church that we cannot judge other people. It doesn't mean we don't make judgments about what's wrong and what's right. It means we don't make judgments about individuals. And, and he's right about that. We don't know the heart of somebody else. We can't condemn somebody else. But we have a duty, if we think someone's hurting himself, to point that out. And we think that any, anyone who lives a lifestyle contrary to the teachings of Jesus is hurting himself. So we can't be quiet about those things. We can, it's important to be loving and clear, and very important not to be mean and nasty and divisive. But, you know, not to teach what Jesus teaches, to abandon uh, the central notion of what the church is about. Quoting the Pope, last July when asked about homosexual priests, he said, if someone is gay and he searches for the Lord and has good will, who am I to judge? And then he added, we shouldn't marginalize people for this. They must be integrated into society. Doesn't society also mean, uh, how can they be integrated into society if they're not integrated into the church? Well, they, they're, they're certainly welcome into the church. You know, the fact that people do things that are wrong doesn't exclude them from the church. But the church will always tell them that the Lord is calling you to something other than what you're doing if they've embraced a lifestyle contrary to the teachings of the church. You know, you don't reject people because you see them doing something harmful to themselves or something wrong. You love them all the more. We do that in our families. You know, parents can be very worried about their children, constantly call their children to a different whatever it is that they're disturbed about, but they still love them and they, haven't, they don't kick them out of their families. Will there be any organized conversation during the world meeting of families about the notion of reform vis-a-vis -vis remarried divorced Catholics and homosexual Catholics? Will that come up? Will that be part of the conversation? You know, the, the, quite, the way you ask the question is, is uh, presuming that the church changing her teaching on these matters would be reform. Uh, it wouldn't be reform, it would be acting contrary to what the church has taught through the centuries. Reform is trying to get Catholic couples who are not faithful to one another to re-embrace that fidelity. Reform would mean for those who don't follow the church's teaching about human sexuality to embrace the, human, the church's understanding of human sexuality. So, you know, let's be careful how we use the word reform. You know, it's a, the, if people want us to reform by being acting contrary to what we believe, that's not reform. So it, are we going to discuss the issue of uh, homosexual issues within family life? Yes. Are we going to use that as a platform to try to change the church's teaching? No. We're going to use it as a platform to explain the church's teaching and help people embrace it. We are going to talk about fidelity in marriage life and what to do when marriages are broken. We have a lot of situations like that are tragic you know, where a husband abandons his wife and his children. We're going to talk about that, but we're not going to say this is just wonderful and we're, let's uh, forget about it and start over again in a new family. You know, we, uh, when you do things that hurt people, you need to reform in a way that corrects the bad things that you did to them. And people who have abandoned their families have a duty to the family that they've abandoned. They can't just pretend that never happened. I was going to ask you, where, where is the word reform relevant in terms of the Catholic Church and what you might be talking about 
at the World Meeting of Families. The, the word reform in Catholic tradition means conversion, which means we reform our life after the pattern given to us by the gospel. That's simply what it means. It doesn't mean that we exchange the teaching of Jesus Christ for the teachings of the current age. You know, if we believe that Jesus is God become man, and that he, what he says is true, and we change ourselves rather than his teachings. And that's what the Catholic Church has always meant by reform or conversion, that we change. Not that we change the Jesus' teaching because they're not convenient for us. All right, well, let's talk Turkey for a second. You are known as a conservative cleric, if you will. Aren't all bishops conservative? That's what I wanted to ask you. Well, what's our duty? We only have one duty as bishops that's different from the duty of priests, and that's to guarantee that the teachings of the church in our time correspond to the apostolic teachings of the church, which means the teachings of the apostles who were closest to Jesus. So it's an intrinsically conservative responsibility, which is to conserve the truth of the gospel. And that's what uh, I am about more than anything else. Now, we have to do it in a way that's attractive to the contemporary world, that's clear, that engages all the current issues and new perspectives, but it doesn't mean that we change the church, because if we change the church, uh, we've given up our primary responsibility, which is to be faithful to what the church has always been. Let me talk for a second about um, the modern world, if you will. Yes. Um, a CNN poll says 64% of American Catholics want the church to allow priests to marry. And 76% want the church to allow Catholics to use birth control. I know you know these numbers. Do they have any impact on the way you view these issues? Uh, well, first of all, uh, the, I, I think polls are very important so we know where people stand. But the Catholic Church is not a church that, uh, whose teaching depends on polls. And the only one constituent that matters, and that's Jesus Christ. So if what the people ask for is that the church be more faithful to Jesus Christ, I'm all enthusiastic about it. If the polls tell me that we should teach differently than he taught, I'm not interested in it at all. Uh, because we don't believe the church is uh, something we tinker with according to our own preferences. Now, if you get a poll of people who actually practice the church and understand what the church is teaching, you get very different statistics than the general poll of people who were born into the Catholic Church or baptized but don't go anymore. So those are the polls that are really more significant. But even those, if they would ask for the church to teach, change its teaching on issues that are, you know, on faith and morals that are foundational and significant, we couldn't change. Does it concern you that more American Catholics are disengaging from the church because they feel the church doesn't accommodate their modern lifestyle. Certainly. In, in these issues particularly. Certainly it, it does concern me that that happens. It means we're not doing a very good job of convincing them that uh, what we teach is really good for them. You know, so that is of great concern to me. But again, it's not a popularity contest that I'm interested in. It's uh, whether or not I effectively preach the gospel. We think the gospel is very attractive in itself. And if it's clearly and effectively preached, people will be attracted to it. But you read the Gospels even. There are a lot of people who heard what Jesus said and didn't like it. And they walked away. And there were people who didn't like it so much that they crucified him. So if we're following the pattern of Jesus Christ, it doesn't seem like he checked to see what the weather was before he spoke. He spoke clearly with confidence and taught what he thought the Father wanted him to speak. You have made substantial progress in reducing the budget deficit that, that was overwhelming when you came into your job. Um, part of the way you've done that is to consolidate parishes. And we're waiting to find out the fate of 14 parishes. Uh, you have already closed 47 uh, under the uh, parish area pastoral planning initiative. Can you give us some preview some indication as to what's going to happen with those 14 parishes uh, and beyond that? I actually cannot because I haven't seen the final reports uh, there, that are being uh, put together right now. Um, uh, we always like to refer to what happened before as the merger of parishes. Uh, it re certainly requires closing some of them, but uh, we, we certainly have enough parishes to meet the needs of the people in our various communities. Uh, everybody that I talk to, even those who are angry with me because we've closed their parish, say that per mergers need to take place. People have moved. People don't go to church anymore. We can't keep open buildings that we don't need. 
The problem is they want me to pick their parish as a place people move into rather than another one. And that, I mean, that's across the board. People admit we need to do something because we just can't afford keeping open buildings that are not necessary. The church isn't building, it's people who believe. You know? So what's going to happen in the future? You know, we've tackled the more difficult situations historically already. And so I think that as we move into the future, there'll be fewer mergers because we went to the places where we saw bigger problems, bigger financial problems and personnel problems at the beginning. So I think we'll see less and less as time goes on, but we're committed to review all the parishes in the Archdiocese just to see what the options should be in the future. It occurs to me that um, the management of the 76ers said the other day, we've bottomed out. Uh, the future is brighter. Would you say that the same is true for uh, the consolidation of parishes in the archdiocese? Well, it's working. My, my annual deficit when I arrived was $17 million a right. year. You're down to about $4 million? About, about $4 million now. You can see that's a huge difference. And the difference is, it's not like we have a lot more income coming in. It's difference is we're not subsidizing schools and parishes that cannot keep themselves open. But we have enough schools and we have enough parishes to meet the demand. In fact, we have a lot of empty seats in our schools even now. Uh, so we, we think we're providing opportunities, but just not in the way we did before. What is the state of Catholic education in the archdiocese? In, ter in terms of enthusiasm, very, very healthy. In terms of uh, support from the broader community, very healthy. But we still have huge problems. You know, these schools were built in the 30s and 40s and 50s when we had thousands of sisters working in our schools, receiving very small salaries. Because of that, they have retirement problems now. Uh, now all the money we have is going into teacher salaries, and still we're not paying what public school teachers get. Um, so, but the buildings are starting to deteriorate. So now I have a problem where all the money is going into salaries, and we have building problems. So, so where we're what we're going to do about this, I don't know. It's hard for me to imagine that if we don't get assistance from the state, that we're going to be able to keep all of our schools open. Which puts you in competition with the Philadelphia Public School District, well, of we course. See we're, we're in competition. We see we're in friendly uh, union with them working together because their goal and our goal is to educate kids. And if we can do it in a way that parents are pleased, why not? Why don't we have the broader support of the school to do it? You know, we don't want to take away anyone else's schools. We just want help for ours as well. Are you absolutely confident that there is not one priest in your archdiocese who is currently abusing children? If I knew there were, that person would be removed. You know, I don't always know everything. And I certainly do my best to know everything. But we are human beings, we're weak human beings, all of us. And uh, as far as I know, there isn't a single person in, in, um, in our uh, uh, parishes and our schools, uh, in public ministry, who has a history of uh, abusing children. When you came in to the Archdiocese, it was getting a great deal of attention. Uh, trials were ongoing, and I think um, members of the flock were uh, uh, terribly distressed by what they felt was a dangerous situation. Well, they were astonished by that this could have even happened in the Catholic Church. Right. Do you think that, that, do you think that from that point of view, the situation has improved to the point where you can say, I'm pretty confident that we're okay right now. I think most people think their own parish is okay, but they worry about other situations because they hear about these historical incidents, most of which have taken place long in the past, and that causes them to be concerned. And I understand that, and I want to do all I can personally, but also as a church, to convince people that we've taken it seriously. We're going to do all our do our best to make sure that this never happens again. Can you think of? But I can't change human nature, so mm -hmm. you know. It's tragic what happens in our public schools, in other environments, uh, in terms of sexual abuse of children. Uh, but we should do our best to guard them and protect them. But we can't guarantee that it would never happen again because we're dealing with human beings. Can you think of any worse a betrayal? No. Your five predecessors, going all the way back to uh, Cardinal Dennis Doherty in 1918, uh, were elevated to the status of cardinal when they became Archbishop of right. Philadelphia. That has yet to happen for you. Are you getting a tad bit impatient? Uh, I don't know that it will happen. You know, Pope Francis has been doing it differently. You know, many of the places in Italy that used to have cardinals don't. He's been appointing bishops in other dioceses in Italy and around the world that have never had a cardinal before. 
There's a limit to the number, 120. The Pope is trying to internationalize this more than in the past and giving opportunities to local churches or dioceses that have never had a cardinal to have them. So I don't know what the intention of the Pope will be. Uh, you know, if I'm not named a cardinal, I will not be disappointed. To be the Archbishop of Philadelphia is a great privilege as it is. Uh, the responsibility of cardinals is, is a, a big responsibility. They elect the next Pope, but that's not at the essence of what it means to be a bishop. The essence of being a bishop is to be a successor of the apostles in a local church or diocese. And I had the privilege of being the bishop of one of the most important, historically important dioceses in the United States. And I'm grateful for that blessing. You wouldn't be even a little disappointed? I won't be personally disappointed, but I think that the people of Philadelphia probably would be. They're used, as you said, to having a cardinal as their archbishop. And many of them call me cardinal. And many of them refer to me as your eminence, which is a, a you know, a, a, a title we give to cardinals. They think I am already because they're used to it. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen again. And uh, I think it's interesting that the Pope is uh, doing different things. We don't always have to do things the way you did them in the past. I believe that about our local church, so I, why wouldn't I believe that about the universal church? Well, let the Pope make that decision. He'll make a good decision. Do you think Pope Francis can be a groundbreaking pontiff? And if so, what would that look like? Well, I think one way it would look like in the United States would be for him to speak about immigration issues here and convince us as a country to finally handle this issue and not use it as a a political tool to beat up the other side. You know, we need to face this issue as a country, and perhaps he'll be able to call us to that when he visits here. I hope he will. I think he can be groundbreaking in a lot of ways. Uh, there's talk today that he might visit Cuba on the way here, on the way back home. Apparently, he had a role in, in bringing our uh, country and Cuba to begin a dialogue. And that was groundbreaking, so I hope he does all kinds of things like that. What is the major pastoral challenge uh, for the Philadelphia Archdiocese? That the people who are Catholics are actually believers. That's always been the, the, the big challenge of the church, that we believe what we say we believe, and then we, we let our actions flow from that into the future. It's conversion, it's reform, it's change of the, of the person after the pattern of the gospel. Uh, that's always gonna be our biggest problem for our clergy and our laity alike, and that's the biggest problem of our future.